go I do want to welcome you to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. Uh, we're continuing on in our study in the Sermon on the Mount. This is our 13th week in that study. And uh, I'm finding it truly a blessing for myself. As many times as I have studied the Sermon on the Mount, as many times as I have taught the Sermon on the Mount, about the Sermon on the Mount, and as many times as I have preached from it, it's like I'm, I'm seeing something new in it. Uh, and and it's, it's been a real blessing to me, and I pray that it's been a real blessing to you. I do want to remind you that while you know, we can share across the Internet, obviously right now it's not interactive, but we do encourage you to write to us at office at BibleTalk.com with any suggestions or comments or questions that you might have. We love to hear from you. Uh, and we want to know that you're watching and where you're watching from. That's a, that's a blessing to us, too. So let's pick up where we left off in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. But before we do, let's start with a prayer to ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Mark, have you do that for us? Oh Lord, we just thank you for our ability to get here and to see and hear the Word of God. Just put it in our spirits so we can uh, grow from grow from it and in and in it and just give it to uh, just give it to others when your spirit arises and prompts us to. Just, we thank you for your word. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, as I say, we've, we've been in this for 13, or this is our, for 12 weeks. And we are right now in verse 20, in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And I, I just remind you that I've said over and over through this time that this is the most radical, fanatical sermon that was ever preached. It's also the earliest full sermon that Jesus ever preached as he had um, named his apostles, and he, so he, he is giving this teaching to his apostles and his disciples. You always see the pictures of crowds around, and the crowds were certainly there to hear it, but he wasn't speaking to them, he was teaching his disciples. And what he was teaching them was about righteousness. Right? He had called them to, to righteousness, and now this is training in righteousness, how we are to walk in righteousness. So, so this is how the church should walk today. The Sermon on the Mount is the way that Christianity should look. That's right. This is the definitive teaching of Jesus Christ. And I've said, if you really think about this, I mean, it's almost like everything else is commentary about this, mm -hmm. right? All right, so verse 20, let me read verse 20. Okay. Jesus said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's about righteousness. And he says the righteousness of the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees. And we'll look at that and say, you know, was there's real righteousness? Or the thing is, is that it, I read into this that it's like you have to surpass the religion. Well, it is. And that's one of the things that we have talked about. Is that what I see the Sermon on the Mount as, as is a transition from religion to righteousness. Because what he's talking about, and is he, he said, and we, this is what we studied last week, was about, don't think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. They're still there. So it's not like, you know, the, the, the Jewish people had the wrong thing. They were just doing the thing wrong. Because it's about what's in our hearts. And that's what we're going to talk about here, all right? I've also said that the Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount are basically the sermon and everything else is commentary. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus is talking to us now about what our righteousness should look like, it's, this is not just a, a, you know, some kind of study that is <coughs> hypothetical. Because remember what he said in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Mm -hmm. We should have a passion. We should have a hunger to find this righteousness mm -hmm. that he is describing in our lives, right? But it's different than what the Jews were seeing in the religious leaders of the time, right? Mm -hmm. What he's saying is, 
their, their righteousness is not sufficient. Well, because it wasn't true righteousness. It was religion. It wasn't righteousness. Okay? So, um, and Jesus said, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. That's here in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, right? So, you know, I said you, you can't, you usually hear people take verses out of the Sermon on the Mount. But the whole thing is a piece. And it is intertwined and interknit. All right? So we're, we're talking here, but in, like I said, in Matthew 6, one, still the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you know, that you don't practice your righteousness to be seen by men. Right? That's what the Pharisees and the scribes were doing. And Jesus said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. What was the leaven? Well, he says very clearly um, in Luke 12, 1, listen to this, under these circumstances that so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, Jesus began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. All right? So he's saying, he, if you put, when you begin to put all this together, and he's talking about the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the time. And he said that they do this for outward appearance to be seen by men. And he said, well, beware of the leaven, because that's hypocrisy. Well, what is hypocrisy? I'm glad you asked that question. Because as, as usual, I like to give you definitions. definitions from the dictionary. And I'm going to use the Collins English Dictionary here. Hypocrisy is a noun, the practice of professing standards, beliefs, etc., Contrary to one's real character, professing beliefs, but they're not. That's Actually, not the reality so of your life, right? right. Yeah. The word hypocrite literally comes from a Greek term that was used for actors. It meant actors, mm. because actors were people who pretended to be something that they weren't. Right? That's what a hypocrite is: somebody who pretends to be something that he is not. Okay. God searches the heart. Man judges by outward appearance. This is what the Lord spoke to Samuel, right? But God searches the heart. We need to recognize that what's in our heart has to manifest itself in everything in our lives. It should be, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It should be what generates our words. But it also, what's in our heart should radiate out and affect every action in our lives. Right? That wasn't true with the Pharisees. You know, Jesus at one point said to the Pharisees, you're whitewashed tombs filled with dead man's bones. You know, all pretty on the outside, but nothing but death on the inside. And you don't have to study the New Testament very much to see the harsh relationship that Jesus had with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Because, and these are the most religious people. And, and I want to, I'm going to bounce around here because... Uh, We've been doing so much this week, I haven't had much time to even to pre-pray, as I like to do for this. You use the term harsh. Is adversarial more accurate? Well, he was certainly, it was an adversarial relationship. And, you know, if you remind me later, I mean, we'll talk about why. Adversarial means that there's opposition, right? Mm -hmm. They're in opposition. And they were very definitely in opposition because Jesus stood for a right relationship with the Father that comes through his atoning work and then is manifest in the way that we live. The gift of new life is what Christ brought us as the gift from the Father. But new life should result in new lifestyle. And that new lifestyle is righteousness. Right? So that's what he's manifesting. But what he's saying, but the, 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 the religious leaders of his day, they are doing you know, everything on the outside to look like, well, this is what God approves of, and this is what makes you right with God. That's what they were proclaiming. And yet Jesus is saying that there's, their righteousness is not good, it's not sufficient, it's not enough, because it's not what makes you right with the Father. And one of the things that I will want to talk about is the fact, I don't know that there's any difference between the, the religious leaders of his day and the majority of religious leaders today. Now, let me, 
Okay, before I go further, let me just talk about it. See, he said here, because, you know, you hear, he's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. Oftentimes you hear about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Mm -hmm. There's division. These are like denominations. In the time of Jesus Christ, these are the major denominations of, of the Jewish people. Uh, particularly the Pharisees on the one hand and the Sadducees on the other. Now, there were other groups in, in Israel at the time. The primary other group were the Essenes. And the Essenes were total separatists. That's These are the people that, uh, that well, lived... No, law? I mean, mm -hmm. government type of... No, not at all. No, please. No, no, no not, not at all. Um, they separated themselves from Jerusalem. And they separated themselves from both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they lived down, you know, their main place and where we know them best from, arche from archaeological studies and not from Scripture, because there's no mention of them in Scriptures. It is down by the Dead Sea in Qumran, which is where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from. They were the ones who amassed the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? But they separated themselves from all the other Jews. Having said that, what the word Pharisee means is to separate. So they were, the, if you look at our primary denominational split in the church today, you know, I would call it where you have evangelical and you have mainline, all right? The evangelicals are kind of the Pharisees, and the main line would be the Sadducees. Okay. Now, you have lots of subsets within that, right? Mm -hmm. The scribes are kind of a subset of the, of the Pharisees. They're in that same denomination, but their function is different. Mm -hmm. The scribes have become basically the lawyers, the, you know, the canon lawyers, and they have become responsible for transmitting Scripture. The Pharisees held to a very, what they considered, their very rigorous approach to Scripture and well, adherence to the Scripture. To the the well, that, that sounds nice, but in fact it wasn't because, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Whereas the Sadducees didn't really hold so much to the Scriptures. They had become, they didn't believe in an afterlife, for example. Oh. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they were more the priestly class. Let me say this while I'm at it. So that kind of separation, that division, that is the, the natural result of sin. Okay? What was the first result of sin in the Scripture? Separation, separation from, God. from God. Absolutely. Adam and Eve separated themselves from God and hid themselves from God. Sin will always bring separation. Division, and, and let me make this as clear as I can possibly make it. Division is a sin, and it is an abomination in the eyes of God. When we are talking about believers, right. okay, if you are talking about believers and non-believers, there is supposed to be a separation. The Word of God says, what has a believer in common with a non-believer? But within the body of believers, there should, be no there should be no division. And it's not just, that's not a suggestion, that is a command of God, and it was the prayer of Jesus Christ, right? It was the last prayer. The last prayer. I mean, you want to talk about significant. Yes, All right. yes, absolutely. So, these Pharisees, they, they were the most religious-looking people there were. They were the strictest when it came to, and I'm using this term generously, to Scripture. But the fact of the matter was, it's not so much Scripture. Because what happened is they intertwined Scripture with tradition until the two became inseparable in their eyes. And you couldn't tell the difference. And... What became more important was the tradition over the scripture. You know, the biggest Christian denomination in the world today is the Roman Catholic Church. And they say that they are guided and led by, and this is, you know, this is a theological position of the church. This is not an opinion of mine. That they are led by scripture and tradition. However, when scripture and tradition come into conflict, as they will, then in their case, tradition always has the upper hand. And that was the case with the Pharisees, right? I, I want to just take a minute here to, to share something with you. Because I, I, you know, I think there's a significance to this. I just, it's kind of a cute little thing, I think. Okay. Back in 1979, 1980, 
Alice and I, had, I was pastor of a church in New York, and I felt led by the, led by the Lord to, we were going to go travel uh, around the country, preaching and teaching wherever the Lord opened doors of opportunity for us. So I went out and I bought, uh, I didn't buy a motorhome. We were in a position to buy a motorhome. The Lord I, led you to a yes, school bus. And we were miraculously able to buy a 35-foot flat-nosed school bus bus in the Bronx, New York. Miraculously. I mean, that's yes. not a whole other story. And as soon as I bought that, because I was going to convert it myself in my spare time, that's a joke. Um, what I did is I took all, all of the seats out of the school bus and got rid of those. So now I'm sitting there and I've got this empty bus and I'm planning, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to build out uh, this, this motorhome. Which let, me, part, let me just interject here. The joke um, is not that didn't do the bus. The joke is the spare time. The spare, yeah. Right. Because I was a full-time pastor. Did, yeah, he actually did. I was also the uh, national sales manager for a communications right. company in New York, and I was building the bus. Right. So I had three full-time jobs. Okay. Yes, I slept. Yes, you did. Not that much. Okay, that's... So anyhow, one of the first things I did was I went to uh, the state of New York, to the DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles, to register this bus. And I went in and, you know, I, I presented my, my case. I had the forms filled out to get a registration for the bus. And the lady behind the counter said, uh, what's, what is this vehicle? And I said, well, it was a bus and I'm going to make a motorhome. And she said, well, is it a bus or a motorhome? I said, well, it's going to be a motorhome. And she said, well, is it a bus now? I said, I guess it's a bus. She said, does it have bus seats in it? I said, no, it doesn't have any bus seats in it. I've taken them out. And she says, well, does it have any furniture in it, like a bed or anything? I said, no, it doesn't. I'm planning on putting it in. She said, well, then it's not, it's not a bus and it's not a motorhome. So we can't give you a license. Can't give you a license plates. And I, I, so I'm going through this whole thing with her over and over. It Sounds like an Abbott Costello. Well, it does, but this is in New York. And if you, if you can picture this in your mind, the, the motor vehicle department in New York in New York City, or this was in Yonkers, it's just massively crowded and busy. Right. And, oh, my goodness. So I'm going through all of this with her, and she's just telling me well, I, th that they're not going to budge and they're not going to give me license plates because they don't know what it is. It's not a bus, no, no, and it's not a motorhome. Yeah. And by the way, license plates and registration in New York at the time for a bus or a motorhome is very, very expensive. It's not like a car at all, right? So now I had gone to the Motor Vehicle Bureau while I was working on the bus. So I was dressed, I had been working, doing carpentry work on the bus. Mm -hmm. So I'm dressed in dungarees and, and a sweatshirt, and I, I, I looked like I had been working, okay? So finally, uh, she calls over her supervisor. So the manager comes over from the, from the DMV, and it was an African-American woman, and uh, we, she starts to go, and she's telling me the same thing. And it, so at one point she says to me, well, what are you doing? What are you, and I, so I explained to her, I said, well, I'm a preacher. I preach the good news of Jesus Christ, and I'm going out to preach it. And she looked at me, and she, I mean, just got this look on her face. And she said, well, you don't look like a preacher. And I said, well, neither did my brother. His name was Jesus Christ. He looked like a carpenter. And she actually, she stopped, looked up like this smiled at me and turned to the lady and said, all right, give him plates. They gave me plates for a car. I had the biggest car in New York State. I also had the cheapest license plates you could get for a vehicle. So, I mean, the Lord blessed it. But that was her response. You don't look like a preacher. Now, the reason I say that is because most of the world doesn't know what a preacher is looks like. Now they knew what the Pharisees looked like and they know what preachers look like because they got their fancy clothes on or they have a collar on or you know and that's how they know whether a person is a preacher or not by that outward appearance. Jesus didn't look like that. He looked like a carpenter. You know why? That's what he was. And then he was an itinerant preacher. And I bet you Peter didn't look like a Pharisee. He looked like a fisherman. 
And when he first got cold, he probably smelled like a fisherman. Mm. Well, it's true. Yeah. So the world doesn't know what a preacher looks like. Because what they see is, and bear with me, I, I don't try, I'm not, I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I'm trying to be factual. Because, you know, the Apostle Paul wrote and said that love rejoices in the truth. So most people, and most of, most of the church, and most unbelievers, their perception of what a preacher looks like is what they see on television. You know, the guy with the fancy, expensive, very, very expensive suit who stands up in front of the television cameras. And is that what a preacher looks like? Or how do you tell from the outside? I, I want to tell you this, all right? And you, if I've said something that stirs in you a second, and you're answering that question in your mind, I want to tell you what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you shall know them by their fruit. It's not by the way you dress. It's not by the accent you speak with. It's not by how highly or unhighly educated you are. It is by the fruit of the Spirit and the evidence of the Holy Spirit that we should be testing these things. When John the Apostle said, test the spirits for many false prophets have gone abroad, you don't test prophets by the way they dress, by what kind of cars they drive, by how many people follow their ministry. There is scripture, and that's what we talked about last week, when Jesus talks that, don't, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. But you've got to test the prophets, and you have to know how to test the prophets. The Jews of the time of Jesus Christ didn't know how to test these things. Why? Because they had been trained by the Pharisees and Sadducees. They had been trained to look for the things that the Pharisees brought, what did they bring? They prayed the loudest. They prayed up front. They prayed the best. Uh, they prayed the really good King James prayers, right? I mean, they they tithed. And when they tithed, boy, they made sure that everybody knew that they were tithing. They were doing all these things, the outward appearance. But Jesus searches the heart. The righteousness that we have to have is not those things that the Pharisees had because it wasn't right. The other thing I want to talk about is when we were on that bus, and finally, after some years, God called us to stop and start another church. Uh, we had started a Bible study. We, we moved out of the bus. We sold the bus, and we moved into an apartment in Central Florida here. And, uh, and then, again, this is an, going back a number of years, quite a number of years. And we started... That's what we did, is we stopped, we got an apartment, and I started a Bible study group, and I just kept growing, and we knew that that was the foundation of a church, and a church is a gathering of believers. You know, you ask people what a church looks like, and they're going to tell you the building down the streets. So, um, what we were outgrowing that, that apartment. We didn't have enough room in that apartment for people to gather. So, I started praying, asking the Lord what to do, and it just so happened uh, about a mile away from us, on the corner of two state roads there in it was Sanford in Central Florida, there was an office building, a two-story office building, and uh, right on the corner of two highways, and it had a sign outside that was for sale. And I don't know why, because I'll tell you, we had absolutely no money. We were totally living by faith, and we didn't have any funds. You had $11. I had $11 at, this, at the time that I'm going to tell you about. And I called the telephone number, and I said, I'm just, just out of curiosity. I said, I'd just like to know what you're asking for that building. And he told me, and it was a lot of money. And I, I said, well, thank you very much. And he said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, you know, what were you interested in? I said, well, I was just curious about, and I don't know why. I mean, why it was the Spirit of God that led me to call. So he said, well, what were you looking for? I said, well, we're looking for a place where we can have, you know, uh, I'm starting, I guess, you know, the Lord is using me to start a church here and, and he said, well, why don't you meet with me and have a cup of coffee? I'd just like to talk to you. And I said, well, listen, I don't, I mean, you know, I don't want to waste your time. We don't have, I don't have the money for that. And he said, well, why can't you meet me? I'd like to buy you a cup of coffee. So I did, and I joined him at a, what was at the time, I think, a Sambo's restaurant. Yeah, and met him for a cup of coffee. And I was with him for probably 45 minutes to an hour. And at the end of that hour, I walked out of that coffee place with the key to the building in my hand. Because it turned out that he managed this property 
for a family that were missionaries in Haiti that owned the building. And he said, you know what? They would rather have this used for the Lord's purposes and not make any money than to make money and use it for... So they, they just, we made arrangements that we would get this building and we would, you know, pay and the way deferred payments, low payments. And I walked out. And as Alice said, I walked out that day, I had $11 in my pocket, and I walked out with the keys to the building in my hand. Well, late, later on, we were in a position, We, I, through some circumstances, we met a fella on the, the biggest radio station in Orlando who had a secular talk show, mm -hmm. not a Christian by any means whatsoever. And he wound up, he came out to visit me at, at this building. And he went back, we had a nice time, and we had a Christian school there. We also, and we're a small congregation, but we, we happened to have probably the largest food distribution program in the county that we were in, giving food to the hungry and needy and, and helping people and clothing. And he, he walked out, and on the radio from that point on, because this man not only was not a Christian, he, he was bad mouth Christian. He was bad mouth Christian. He was not a friend of the church. And at the time, for example, the first megachurch was being built in the Orlando That's area. Okay. And it upset him greatly because they were spending millions and millions of dollars on this grand, grand edifice. And every time he would complain about this, and he complained about it a lot, and what was going on in the church, he, he would say, but you know, I went to this church one time up in, in Sanford. And he said, this it was a, kind of a raggedy old building. Kind of run down. A run down building. And he said, but there was something there. You know why? Because people don't know what the church looks like. Because they think that the church is a building rather than a gathering of believers wherever they choose to gather. So, so you discussed churches. We don't know what a church is supposed to look like. Uh -huh. We discussed preachers because we don't know what preachers is. And it's all based upon righteousness because we don't know what that looks like. Ta -da. Now, that's exactly the point that I want to make. Um, you know, it's, it really is that, that way that it would be one thing to say, well, the world doesn't know what the church looks like. The church doesn't know what the church but is the supposed church to look like. But the church doesn't know what the church right. is supposed to look like. And, you know, it's, it's, I find this fascinating. And... I preach about this a lot. I talk about it a lot. I get to preach to a lot of, as we travel around the world. As a matter of fact, this was the big theme of my preaching for a number of months over in, in Europe. Uh, and we're about, we're getting ready to go again a month from now. We'll be going for five months. But it was the fact that the church doesn't know what the church looks like. And it's a building. And I was in Manchester, England, and I preached uh, to a conference of pastors and I asked him, I said, how many of you here are Bible believers? And of course, every hand in the place just shot up. And I said, how many of you will go into your congregation this week and say, welcome to the house of the Lord? And when I said it, it was interesting to watch their reaction. Because most of them are going, and they're going to go and say, welcome to the house of the Lord. But something struck them, and it's like, oh, wait a minute, I better be careful what I say. Because I said, that's a, that's a lie. It says it in Acts chapter 5, it says it in Acts chapter 17, and both of those are quotes from a number of places in the Old Testament. God says that he will not live, he will not dwell in a house built for him by the hands of man. But it says over and over and over, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you think that a building is a church, and don't understand that we are the church, you will act differently inside that building, than you do outside that building. And you know what that's called? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. You know what that is? It's leaven. You know what that is? That's imitating the Pharisees. We're playing religion. And that is the great, great danger. And it doesn't take much. One of the things about leaven, and, and think about this. Because it looks very nice. What was it? Um, a leaven could be considered pride. Well, you know, it's more than pride. The root of all of this is pride, by the way. Right. But there's this uh, one book. What's that guy who wrote the book? 
Jesus? No. A guy who wrote the book on Friday. There was a book in the 1800s. Arthur? No. I knew what you Murray. said. Murray. Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray. He wrote a lot of books on Friday, yes. Yeah. And it's and you get into that and it's it's an it's insidious. It's absolutely insidious. And by the way, pride is kind of the gateway to all sin. Yeah. Because that's what right. Satan did. Well but but it's it, that's the root of his problem and that's what he carried forth. But it says in Proverbs chapter chapter six that six things does the Lord hate, yea, even seven are an abomination. And the first one is forty eyes. That's pride. And that's the gateway. It opens the door to all sin and all sorts of sin. And you're right. It's insidious. It's just, it creeps in. It'll take every single advantage. This is something that we have to constantly ask the yes, Lord to Because it is our human nature. And let me qualify by saying it is our fallen human nature where we want to be elevated. And here is righteousness. The Lord says, humble yourself and he will exalt you. You know, it's the righteousness of God is for us to claim that we have no righteousness. You know, I, I can say, and I, I am given to say this as a matter of fact, you know, because when people ask me how I am, I'm never quite sure how I'm going to answer it, but I know I'm not going to say, oh, I'm feeling okay today. Well, that's, not, that's not what's coming out. And oftentimes I'll say, you know, somebody asks me how I am, and I'll say, well, I am the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, because that's what the Word says. But I'm the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I have no righteousness of my own. It says our righteousness is as filthy rags, rags in Isaiah 58. And yes. the scripture today was, I must decrease. And he might increase, increase, quoting John the Baptist. So, I mean, this is simply the most important concept to grasp as we go into this teaching. And where does it start? I'm going back. You know, I said this is commentary on the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because if you are poor in spirit, you claim that you have nothing of your own. Including goodness. You have no goodness of your own. You have no righteousness of your own. You have no nothing of value of your own. But God has entrusted you with his righteousness. With his goodness. With his word. With his love. It all belongs to him. That's right. Everything. Everything belongs to him. And it's like when we get that way, then we don't have to try and impress people, which the Pharisees were always trying to do. But Paul writing, and I, I say all the rest of the scripture is commentary on this. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, Paul is saying, he wrote to Timothy, and he said, study to show yourself approved unto God. The Lord is the only one that you have to be approved unto. You don't, the Pharisees are always seeking the approval of men. You have to ask yourself a question. Who's your audience? Who's my audience? Mm -hmm. For a person who's, um, their audience were people. Mm -hmm. A true righteous person, his audience is God. Mm -hmm. Do all things as unto the Lord. I mean, this, that's what I'm saying. This is the, this is the teaching. It's the Sermon on the Mount is the teaching on living in righteousness. And all the rest of the scripture is commentary on it. It's like teaching on this. It really is. This is the core of Christianity is the Sermon on the Mount. Righteousness is being right with God the Father. That was given to us as a free gift. But now we have to live that. We have to walk that. And how do you do that? Well, this is instruction. Because... Again, I go back to what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 316, and he said, All scripture is God breathed and profitable. Profitable for what? For training in righteousness. This is Jesus Christ training his disciples, his apostles, and you and I training us in righteousness. And what he's what he's saying here is it's not about how you appear to men, and it is not about you trying to appear righteous. It's about the reality, and of course, you need to and of course, somebody. what we're dealing with here is just okay. Here's the general, and now we're going to get into all the specifics about don't pray to be seen by men, don't fast to be seen by men, don't you know? It's not about what you were seen before men. Right? It's what's it is that heartfelt relationship with God the Father. We do things 
Why? What are you doing? I mean, what motivates you? What motivated the Pharisees to behave the way they did? They were seeking the approval of man. What is supposed to motivate every single thing that you do in your life? The love of God. Please Him. That's what's supposed to motivate everything in your life. And I'm just not talking about what happens when you go to church on Sunday and how you sing your songs and do your, do your thing. That was what the Pharisees did. I'm talking about Everybody. the way you do there, but the way, you, the way you act at work, the way you treat your children, the way you treat your husband, the way you treat your wife, wives, the way you treat your husbands. Everything that you do has to be motivated by your love of God, first of all. Because what is the law and the prophets? Love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. It's love. The goal of our instruction is love. The royal law of love. The royal law of love. So we have to get to this place where, where we understand where we hunger and thirst for righteousness. But we know it's not about the outward appearance and the way we appear to men. You know, we're, we're coming up as we, as we uh, broadcast this live and record this now, we're coming up on, on Passover. Yes. Right? And one of the most important facets of Passover is to remove the leaven. That's right. Get rid of every every instance, and then they search to make sure that there's not any leaven. Why? Because a li little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, I promise you, I am not a baker. I'm not a cook. I'm hardly even allowed in the kitchen. No, you're not. But I know just from study that you take a little bit of leaven. If you if you you take unleavened bread dough, what are you going to do? And you take leaven and you add it to it, and then you kind of knead it, right? So you're mixing it all in there, and that little bit of leaven affects the entire thing. It's yeast. That's a leaven. That's a leaven. It's a bacterium or something, and it grows and multiplies. Well, but that's a leaven, right? Mm -hmm. So what you have here is, and this is why Jesus is so concerned about this, is because it doesn't take much of this leaven to affect the entire church. That's right. Now, uh, again, it's easy to think, you see, the, the problem is, and I don't know how much I want to get into this and how much I want you to pray about this and begin to see it and ask God to open your eyes to it, is that most of the church today looks like the Pharisees and Sadducees all over again. It's all about looking religious rather than being righteous. And those are the two options. Those are the two things. You can either... You can either strive to look religious or to live righteous, right? And you want, I promise you, you want to tip the scale towards live righteous, not look religious. And the Pharisees, as I say, they were people, somewhere along the line, they, they started with a good heart. Yes. The problem was, where did they go astray? I, I'm going to tell you this. And study it. Let's, let's just turn to the Gospel of Mark for a minute. Mark chapter 7. The Pharisees basically started when it came out of captivity. And there hadn't been a temple yet, right? The synagogues and the teachers. Um, and I know that in the past couple of weeks we've talked about that the Torah is the law. Right? The, it's the first five books of the Bible. And in general... The, the law and the prophets that Jesus talks about, that's what's called the Tanakh. That's the Bible in, in Hebrew, right? But then there is the Talmud. Now, the Talmud is basically a commentary on the Scripture. Okay, um, the Jews were kicked out of Israel in 70 AD. That's after this, AD. yeah. That's after. Then after that, there were more writings by some more Jews because they didn't have the temple there. When did the Torah, um, that's the writings, when, when, or when did those writings take place? Well, the Torah? The, the, that's, they had that. I mean, that goes back to before the first temple. I mean, if you want to talk about where the Torah starts in writing. But the, that's the rabbinical commentaries, right? No, 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 okay. no, 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 that's, there's a thing called a Mishnah, all right? And the Mishnah becomes kind of the oral tradition. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then it's a commentary on the oral tradition that becomes the Talmud. And that gets more and more developed in the early parts of what we call the Christian era, right? 
Um, but, but this is what's important. Where this started to go askew and start to get off track is the, the oral teaching, the mission. Because Jews, what they were doing was they were taking what the Word of God said and filling in the blank spaces. Yeah. Adding to it. Which God says, don't add to it at all. All right? Uh, and what happens is now, people begin to see what they have filled in as being of equal weight with the Scriptures. Got that? Got their traditions. And then, and then, you got the commentary, the rabbinical commentary that starts to build. So now it's not the Word of God that is ruling. Thy Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It is supposed to be the Word of God that guides us in directions. But now with the Jews, what happens, oh yes, it's the Word of God, plus the oral tradition, plus the commentary. So it's been added to. This is one of the reasons... If you don't think this is going on in the church today, well, you, you, wait a minute, you're missing the whole point. Because the fact of the matter is you will not see, you can't see a Christian movie that includes scriptures that's not going to have things added. Somebody's filling in the blanks because there just isn't enough written here to satisfy that fleshly need. Just listen to this, okay? I'm going I'm to start reading... Um, well, let me start reading a first... First one of uh, Mark chapter 7. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him, Jesus, when they had come from Jerusalem, and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such, in, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? So, they haven't come to Jesus and said, They're not doing what the Word says. No. They're not doing what the tradition. They're, what they're doing, they're not, they're not keeping the tradition of the elders. Not the word of God. Mm -hmm. But they were using the tradition of the elders to judge Jesus and his disciples. Okay? That's so important that you understand this. Yes. Because, and now Jesus goes on then to say, right? Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandments of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition." How much of the church today is, is tradition rather than the Word? How much of it is commentary rather than the Word? How much of it is Mishnah that, that filled in parts of the stories? You wouldn't have Christmas That's right. if you didn't have Mishnah, if you didn't have oral traditions mm -hmm. that fill in the blanks. And, you know, the traditions of Easter, which is coming up, is ungodly. Ungodly? That's not quite as strong as me saying it's satanic, um, but it's basically the same same thing. What I will tell you is that the Pharisees judged Jesus by their traditions, not by the Word of God. Right? When they talk about washing the hands, they're not talking about what's written in the Word. They're not talking about Levitical law. They're not talking about the Torah. What they're talking about is traditions that had gathered about how you had to wash your hands before you ate and, and, and do things. Right? I've, I've shared this a number of times, and I've done it in this study here in, in the Sermon on the Mount, that in John chapter 9, in the account of a man who had been born blind that Jesus Christ healed, 
the Pharisees said to that man who had been born blind and was healed by Jesus Christ, that they knew that Jesus was a sinner. Yes. They knew that he was a sinner. How did they know he was a sinner? Because he didn't keep the Sabbath. That's what they said. Right? However, bear in mind this. Jesus never broke the law. He did keep the Sabbath according to the word, but not according to their tradition. And now they were judging him by their tradition rather than the word. How much of Christianity today is tradition rather than the word? A lot. A lot. A lot. It's an astounding thing. It's an astounding thing. Um, you know, I, I heard somebody the other day in a conversation, and I, I really don't remember what the context was, I, I, but I, what, what sticks in my memory was the fact it, they were talking to a, a, a priest. Now, I don't know whether it was a Catholic uh, priest, a Lutheran minister, uh, or an Anglican priest, or a Church of England preach, uh, priest, but they were talking about the fact, uh, he, he said that, oh, thankfully he had his collar on, so people knew that he was a minister. Now I was thinking to myself, if somebody has to, if you have to wear clothing like the Pharisees and Sadducees did, in order for somebody to recognize God within you, and the Word of God and the Spirit of God within you, guess what? I don't know that you have the Word of God, the Spirit of God, or the presence of God within you. This, this, is, this is strong. We talked about it at the beginning of the study, I said, talk about an adversarial relationship. Right um, off the bat, he calls them hypocrites. He calls them hypocrites, but then he says, this people, he's talking about them, he's saying to these Pharisees, and he's speaking to them, he said, rightly did Isaiah prophesy. You know, you come, you, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far away from me. It's all about outward appearance, the things that we do outwardly. And Jesus is saying here, it's, it has nothing to do with the outward appearance. Now, I will tell you, that if you, if you are being led by the Spirit of God, and it is the love of God, the Spirit of God, and the Word of God that is motivating your actions, it's certainly going to affect the outward appearance of what you do. But you're not doing it to be seen by men. I mean, or, you know, you, you do your works in such a way that God is seen glorified, not you. That's in the Sermon on the Mount. But we have added so much tradition. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have time, and I don't want to get into this, and I'll just upset you anyhow. But I'll, you know, I don't, I don't mind upsetting you in the least. Um, very few of my Christian friends are ever going to celebrate Passover, even though the Word of God says that that's to be commemorated and celebrated for all eternity, for all eternity, from generation to generation. But you're going to do this thing that is called Easter, and okay, you say, well, that's all about Jesus being raised from the dead. No, it's not. It may, it may have part of that, but it's not all about that. What's that little because, lemon? Well, how many churches are going to have Easter egg rolling hunts and stuff? What verse is that? What verse is that? You know, it says in the Word of God that we're not even to name another God. We're not even to name. What do you think Easter is? It's Ishtar, the god Ishtar, the goddess Ishtar, the goddess of fertility. We're not supposed to name another God. There is so much added to, to that. But the people that do that are recognized that these are the people that are seen as being, oh, how sweet, how religious. I don't want to be religious. I want to clarify this again. When I talk about religious, I am not talking about what the Word of God says, because He defines religion. Here is pure and undefiled religion in the eyes and the sight of God, the Father, right? To take care of the widows and orphans and keep yourself unstained from the world. It's not about your church building. It's not about the clothes you wear. It's not about you tooting horns when you, you know, give your gift to the Lord and having your name written on something to commemorate what a wonderful giver you are. How many churches would be built if people weren't getting their recognition for their donations? You know what? I'm going to tell you what Jesus said. You got your recognition for You got your reward in full. That's right. And when you allow yourself... When you allow yourself to be glorified by these people, you are being robbed of your reward in heaven. That's what righteousness is versus religion. We need to get very, very serious about this because 
you know, we're running out of time. We are running out of time. I, one of the reasons that I have such a passion for this right now is the fact I, I had somebody ask me today. We had uh, acquaintances, friends, brothers and sister, brother and sister in the Lord. And the fellow asked me very seriously, do you think we're near the end? I said, absolutely. Said, no, I know we're near the end. Uh, I don't think. I, no. I, I absolutely think we are, abs we are really near the end of time. Now, do I know the hour and day? Absolutely not. Not even, Nobody knows the hour and day. Don't be fooled by that. That's right. Only the Father. Not even if you're Mayan Indian. Um, mm -hmm. You don't know, the, you know, you don't know the, the time, the hour and day. But Jesus said we are supposed to be able to recognize signs. signs of the time. And I recognize the signs of the time. And we are living in those last days that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 that Paul talked about in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We are living in those perilous last days. Also that Ezekiel talked about in 36 over, and over and over 39. And everybody. But the fact of the matter is, you know, how much of the church today is focused on the here and now and, and our righteousness takes second place. What's most important right now, am I gonna, I'm not going to be offensive and say for how many Christians are just totally engrossed in March Madness and basketball. And that, because you know who you are. <laughs> Let me go back to where we started. What Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You won't find it with the Pharisees. What you will find with those Pharisees, those religious leaders who want to be seen and glorified by men, what you will see is leaven. And that leaven has the potential, if you allow it, to draw you in and start puffing you up to do the same thing that they're doing. Which is why Jesus, you know, listen, maybe we don't get it with the language. When Jesus said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware, beware. That's like you say to your little kid, you know, don't go over and touch that hot stove. This is dangerous. There is great danger. But... People, you know, which is the, I have a lot of buddies who are pastors. There's so much peer pressure on them mm. to be quote unquote successful. Right. How do they measure success? The size of the congregation, the size of the building, the size of the budget. That's how they measure success. Just like a corporation. Just, exactly like a corporation. Exactly like the world. That's right. Butts and bucks. Write to mark at BibleTalk.com. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Uh, He's only imitating you. Yes, I know. <laughs> I let him say it so I don't get in trouble. Yes, you hate him. Uh, but but the, this is a fact. You know, it's interesting because I participate in a blog for, for I hate to use the term, you know, Christian leaders. Um, you're not supposed to be Christian leaders. You're supposed to be Christian servants. But I was talking about people asking that pastors are dropping like flies in this country, particularly. Burning out. So burning, burning out. They are just, I mean, they are leaving the ministry in incredible, incredible numbers. So the discussion is going on, why? And I said, you know, the reason is, first of all, because of the, because of the pressure on them. Pressure from their denominations, pressure from their el board of elders, pressure from their congregations, pressure from their peers, particularly, uh, to, to meet this standard. And the standard is the size, of the, the size of the building, the size of the budget, and the size of the congregation. That's not godly. And when they do that, that's an unrealistic expectation, and they start, they start to seek those things that God is not causing them to seek. They start building their own kingdom. And like Solomon, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, go read it. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. All of a sudden, Solomon, who has been gifted by God more greatly than anybody at that time with wisdom, forgets why God has given him the wisdom. Why? Because if you read Ecclesiastes chapter 2, you will see it says he built houses for himself. He built, planted vineyards for himself. He gathered slaves for himself. Everything becomes about building his own kingdom. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The vast majority of pastors that are out there today are building their own little kingdoms. They are not building the kingdom of God. For whatever reason. But because of that, they'll wind up like Solomon. Yes. 
who at the end of the day said he hated the works of his hands. Mm-hmm. And, they got become, burned out. and they get frustrated and, and they burn out. And question God, why did they have this yes. wisdom? Yes. yes. Why? Because it became about religion rather than righteousness. Religion seeks to please men. Righteousness seeks to please the Father. Please, if, if anything you get out of all of these studies, please get that. Religion seeks to please men. Righteousness seeks to please God. We're at a place where it's truly, truly dangerous because of that. I, I just I want us all to encourage one another to seek that approval of God, to be doing things that are pleasing to Him, regardless of how men respond, regardless of what the world thinks. You know, Paul said, if I am now seeking to please men, I cannot please God. That's what he said. It's, it's one or the other. You can't do both. So, hunger and thirst for righteousness. And understand that righteousness doesn't look like the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are what looks good in the church today because they are the ones that look religious. Yeah. They are the ones that are building the big congregations. They are the ones that are building the big buildings. They are the ones with the big budgets and lots of money. But the fact of the matter is, what's the difference between them and the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago? I don't know. I was just going to say that it's just blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And those who thirst will be the salt. Yes. So if you're not thirsting after righteousness, then you better start putting on the yes, salt. Your salt. Yeah. You have your salt lost your flavor. Yeah. So, anyhow, I mean, you know, Which is we're, speaking of running out of time, we're getting down to the wire for this, mm. this session of the Bible study. But it, it truly is, it's got to be that we, that we, you know, it says don't, don't practice your righteousness before men. But you've got to practice this. It says in Hebrews 5.14 that the solid food, the meat of the word, is for the mature, who, because of practice, has trained his senses to discern good and evil. We have to practice righteousness, all right? But to be pleasing to God. What is our righteousness? It is being led by the Spirit of God, being led by the Word of God. It is imitating Jesus Christ, not imitating the Pharisees, not imitating the religious leaders. These are those perilous times. I, I, I really do want to pick this up and talk a little bit about it, more about it, because we didn't cover it as, the way I wanted to this evening. But we'll be back on track mm-hmm. on our next session. I promise you that. And until then, let me pray this. Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord God, Lord, that we don't have to depend on ourselves for this righteousness. But it is your spirit that you have placed within us. It is your love that you have poured into our hearts. It is your word that you have written on the tablets of our heart to give us the power to live as we should. We just praise you and thank you for being our God and calling us to be your people. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for giving us the power to live this righteous life. And we thank you for giving us the instruction on living righteously. Till next time, may the Lord our God bless you and use you for the glory of his name. Bye-bye. Only by grace can